Good afternoon and welcome to the related service delivery in the ID classroom session. Um, I am Leanne Brammer and um, I'm uh, the coordinator at the State Department of Education um, for Speech Language Impaired, Assistive Technology, AIM, OT and PT. And I also have with me um, Lee Smithley. Um, who is um, the lead speech language pathologist in Montegalia County and um, a wonderful friend who's agreed to present with me this afternoon. Um, we uh, are hoping that by the time we're finished with this discussion um, that um, you'll be familiar with service delivery options for students in the ID classroom and you'll become familiar with some considerations for communication and understand SMART goals and how to write them. And we know you've all heard of them, but this is just a um, refresher. And then become familiar with integrated goals and team goals. Um, the resources um, for this session are located um, at this link and Libby has posted it in the chat box. So feel free to um, download those at, those at any time. Um, before we get started, we wanted to set the stage. <laughs> First of all, we wanted to thank you guys for being here. It looks as if we have just about a pretty even mix of, of special education teachers and um, Title I teachers, um, specialists, and SLPs. And that's exactly who we need here for this session. Um, you know, other related service providers could be involved as well, but we want to let you know right up front that neither one of us is um, an expert on um, some of these um, topics we're going to be discussing, but they are um, being more prevalent, um, discussed more prevalently and prevalently in the field. And um, as we do that, um, we just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that for this session, we are going to be talking about students who have um, a severe intellectual disability that puts them either in the mild, I mean, the, um, profound or severe range and um, that they're in classrooms the majority of the time um, in a special ed classroom. Um, we are more than willing um, to do some more presentations on this topic and really kind of dig in to doing team goals and the integrated goals because I think it's just so smart for one thing, but the other thing is it's not rocket science. I mean, you know, it really makes sense. Um, and I see that there are some teachers, you know, definitely some teachers on here. So if anyone would like to be involved in some future training, if we do it, um, please email me. Uh, my email address is at the end of the presentation and we'd be happy to have you um, with us because I think it would be um, a valuable training to continue to do. Um, but just know that what we're, we cannot, you know, delve into this really um, um, in depth in an hour. So um, just know that we're going to just present some information for you and hopefully it'll help um, inform your decisions for the future and also um, give you something to think about as far as when you start writing goals um, for um, students in those classrooms. Um, you always have a choice about what we do, but honestly, so many of us are stuck in a rut. I know I used to be um, when I worked in Kanawha County um, for 34 years. I usually worked with students who were nonverbal um, for the last probably 15 to 20 years. And with that, you know, a lot of times you just get in the routine of doing um, pull out therapy, you know, um, doing it um, twice or three times a week if they're students that are nonverbal and um, you know, whatever you think the individual students needs are, but um, trying to consider um, different options um, so that you don't, you aren't stuck in that rut and you're actually considering uh, what the student might need um, is what we're hoping to pique your interest in doing today. Um, the first thing we're going to do and just get out of the way is talk about related services. Um, when we advertise this, the reason I, I wrote it for related services is because that's what I, what I, um, coordinate uh, for the State Department and you know related services um, can include transportation uh, but they can also um, include speech language pathology, audiological services, interpreting services for students who are deaf, um, psychological services, PT and OT, uh, recreation therapy, orientation and mobility, school health. I mean there are so many uh, related services that can be offered through IDEA um, but one of the requirements is they're, they have to, they're required to assist the child with a disability to benefit from special education. And since we have um, 
a wealth of SLPs um, in this group today, um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about communication because honestly, um, it, for these students, communication is, is likely one of their biggest um, barriers to participation in, in taking advantage of their special education services. Because I, I uh, coordinate OTPT and speech, I get emails and calls all the time. Usually it's around reevaluation time and the therapists are asking, do I have to provide therapy um, for these students? You know, they've either plateaued or, um, you know, their language skills are, are kind of commensurate with their uh, problem like their mental age and that kind of thing. And do I have to do it? And the answer to that is, you have to look at the individual needs of the student and determine whether or not they can access their educational environment, which is the special ed classroom. Um, several years ago, um, I think it was 2003, um, excuse me, um, cognitive referencing was um, kind of um, not abolished, but it was it was no longer used to determine eligibility for services for students and the SLPs always ask me, what does ASHA say? Well, this is what ASHA says. ASHA says that the cognitive referencing is a practice of um, comparing IQ scores and language scores as a factor for determining eligibility for speech language intervention. And cognitive referencing is based on the assumption that language functioning cannot surpass cognitive levels. The problem with that is that we're not always looking at comparing those two. We are looking at the, the way the student is able to access their environment and function in that classroom. Um, and so, you know, trying to, to say does IQ equal language, that doesn't really um, give the student the benefit of the doubt as far as what they can do and what they're capable of learning. In 2003, there was the National Joint Committee for Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities, and they addressed the needs of people um, with severe to profound intellectual disabilities, um, autism, and other disorders that result in severe communico, um, socio-communicative and um, cognitive communication impairments. Um, the service delivery models that they recommended included both direct service and indirect, consultative, collaborative service models, and any combination of these models. And here again, it, it's based on the individual needs of the student. As far as that com joint committee was concerned, um, eligibility for communication services and supports should be based on individual communication needs. There's nothing there that says it should be based on a discrepancy between um, mental age and language age. Um, they should be evaluated, planned, and provided by an interdisciplinary team. Um, <clears throat> and um, Augmentative communication should be used for these students if they don't have verbal communication or very limited verbal communication. Leanne, you have a question uh, and, two, and two other people have commented on it. Um, it's difficult to determine IQ in lower functioning students. What if we miscalculate the IQ and de deny services that might have helped students? Well, that's that's what we're saying. You know, um, we're saying that it is hard to evaluate those students, and a lot of it um, sometimes is um, um, subjective. You know, we do Vinland's and um, you know different um, informative um, 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 evaluation measures, and um, that you know that's what this is saying. You don't have to worry about determining the IQ and comparing that with anything because you're looking at the needs of the student. You know, if they're no matter what their IQ is, can they access their educational environment and can they access their special education? If can't, then they need to have the services. Um, let's see. This talks about eligibility determination and it says priority um, criteria, but it that means it's made before or without examination and not supported by factual study. So it violates recommended practice um, for making eligibility determinations for these students. Um, the priority cr criteria um, can be discrepancies between cognitive and communication functioning, um, chronological age, diagnosis, 
absence of co uh, cognitive or other skills purported to be prerequisites, especially if you're talking about or thinking about the old school way of thinking that there were pre prerequisites for um, augmentative communication. We now know that there are no prerequisites because everybody is communicating. They just might need um, support in communicating in a way that's more easily understood. And failure to benefit from previous communication services and supports. That I think is important because, you know, sometimes um, working with students who have augmentative communication needs um, is very difficult because there's no one size fits all for any of those students. And um, if you haven't had experience in training, then sometimes it can be very daunting. And, um, you know, these students are dismissed from therapy because we say they've plateaued or made no progress. But, you know, have you varied the intensity of their services? Have you tried different techniques? Have you um, done a complete AAC evaluation to see where they're functioning uh, receptively? All those things need to be taken into consideration, not just lack of progress on um, IEP goals or um, the difference between uh, cognition and communicative functioning. My big question whenever anyone asks, if they have to provide therapy for these students is how can they access the educational environment without a way to communicate? Uh, you know, that's very hard for me to understand how that could happen. And um, that's a question I think, you know, we need to ask ourselves every time for these students. Um, we weren't sure what the um, makeup of this session was going to be as far as participants. So this is just a brief um, summary of what an augmentative communication system is. Um, they're used by people who have maybe some speech, but are either unable to be understood or have limited speaking ability. Um, these other modes of communication are used to support or supplement what the person's able to say verbally. And, you know, in some instances in those self-contained ID classes, there are students who maybe have single word utterances that are maybe unintelligible or they don't have any um, utterances at all that are intelligible. And in that case, those students um, would need to be um, have an alternative um, communication system. Um, and that's what's what's used for a person who has no speech. But I think that one of the interesting things about this picture is that it shows um, different communication tools. And honestly, these students should be multimodal just like we are. We use our um, phones and we use computers and we use handwriting and, you know, we speak and do social media and all those kinds of things to communicate with people. And they should have those options as well. So all of these communication systems may be used um, by one student. I, I have shown this um, video before, so if you're an SLP and you've seen it, please um, just bear with me and watch it again. It's just it's a little under two minutes, but I think this really brings home um, the the importance of working on communication with students who are in ID self-contained classrooms. Um, this um, video was made by Gail Van Tatenhove, and she is a leader in the AEC world and um, one of the um, first people who really identified core vocabulary as what you need to um, use with students in, in those self-contained classrooms and nonverbal students. So um, just watch this video and while you're watching it, think what would have happened to this man if when he was going through school, people looked at him because of his diagnosis or because of his um, complex needs, because he has physical needs as well as um, um, communication and um, cognitive needs. Think what would have happened to him if no one had taken the time to teach him a communication system. And I'm going to have to stop for just one second and Reese add the sound. Okay. We should be ready now. This is a real B and H customer story. This is a Jack real B and H professional wildlife story. photographer Fred Smith. and B and H customers for thirty years start living in business during the pandemic. Fred, tell us your story. Hi. 
way. Well, John, you've told me quite a story. Why don't you hit speak display so everybody can hear the whole story? Thank you. It was time to eat. I wait and wait. No one there. No one comes. I am afraid no one here will help me eat. <clears throat> I wait more. She come and say to me, you don't tell. She brag and me. She go away. I wait more. Well, I'm glad you could tell me about it. Is there something you need me to do to fix it? You can take care of it yourself. Excellent. Okay. Just thinking about him and the fact that he wasn't being fed at his group home. And, um, you know, what would he have done? How would he have communicated that without... Um, a communication system and he obviously had to start it early um, to be able to use it as well as he does now and for USLPs um, I'm sure you picked up on the fact that he was using mostly core vocabulary um, to build those messages so um, if you're a classroom teacher and um, especially a special ed teacher and you're interested in finding out more about core vocabulary we are actually going to be having Gail Van Tatenhove do some trainings for us. We just did it the other day for um, preschool, but she's going to be um, doing some trainings for us in the state, and uh, we would love to have you um, come. Um, one of the questions I always get is, well, how do I evaluate a nonverbal student? And that's honestly a very good question. You know, um, it's difficult at times, just like it's difficult to get a good measure on their um, cognitive skills um, because of their inability to respond verbally. Um, one of the ways you can do it is by using the communication matrix, and it's an online evaluation that's designed to pinpoint exactly how the student is communicating and assist in identifying um, communication goals. We actually have a project um, that we're doing right now on the communication matrix, and um, we are developing uh, modules because if you have ever given the communication matrix before, you know that it does give you a wonderful um, display about the skills and where the student's functioning. But then after that, it's hard to know what to do next and what steps to take. So that's the piece we're creating in the modules. Um, their implementation modules and they are going to be offered on our website um, and we're going to try to we'll definitely be offering them for ASHA CEUs and possibly for um, continuing ed credit um, non-degree um, continuing ed credit um, graduate credit so um, I'm you know I'm hopeful that that's going to be available starting in like um, September and I think we have a, a training already scheduled um, in September uh, where we're going to be presenting an overview of these modules so um, stay tuned and um, classroom teachers and special ed teachers are welcome to attend as well um, with the, the components of the matrix um, there are four basic aspects of communication and there are um, for communicating. There are seven levels of communication and um, nine categories of behavior that do show um, um, what they're communicating. Um, components of the matrix, this, these are the reasons that, pe that people communicate. And um, it's to refuse things, to obtain things, to engage in social interactions, and to provide or seek information. Now, you know, if you think about the students that you work with in ID classrooms, that's probably about where um, what they're doing um, when they're trying to communicate. Unfortunately, if they don't have a communication system, they may be refusing and trying to obtain things in a manner that's not socially appropriate. Um, and so that's all the more reason to make sure that we are addressing their communication needs. You know, so many times I hear people say, well, if their behavior would improve, we would work on communication. Well, you know, most of you probably know that until you have a way to communicate, that behavior is not going to improve. So that's the reason it's so important to think about um, the communication system for these students. 
Um, one thing that I forgot to mention is that this is for um, people who, and it can be used with adults, um, anybody who's functioning at 24 months or below, um, this um, evaluation is is good for anybody who's functioning above that can probably take some sort of um, standardized language test. And so it wouldn't be necessary to do the communication matrix with them. The nice thing about the matrix is you can have the classroom teacher can complete it, um, the SLP and the parent. Um, and a lot of times you can do it um, as a joint effort um, because, you know, what the parent sees at home may not be what you see at school. Right? And the SLP may identify some things as communication that, you know, until you've done this a couple of times, you really didn't realize were forms of communication. So. I just wanted to mention that because that is a great way to evaluate these students in, in ID classrooms. Um, the communication matrix uh, measures communication, not cognitive ability. Um, lack of communication does not equate to a lack of intelligence. This student um, is, um, has complex communication needs and is um, um, in a wheelchair, he doesn't have any um, volitional control over his um, body parts, but we did do um, the communication matrix on him and did some other um, adapted evaluations and found out he was functioning right around um, um, his chronological age um, receptively. Now expressively, of course, he didn't have a way to, um, to tell us what he knew, but we tried an eye gaze system with him and he was amazing. So, you know, just remember that with the communication matrix, um, um, you can you can figure out, you know, the way they're expressively communicating. That's that's what it does for you. Um, and so many times people think they're not communicating and they are communicating a lot. <laughs> um, together, everyone achieves more. And so that's going to kind of lead us into our um, discussion about interprofessional practice and teaming. Um, you know, I know because I used to do it um, in Kanawha County, we would try to have team meetings and, um, you know, we'd have to give up a lot of time to be able to do that. But for these students with complex needs, um, it's important to be able to do that collaborative piece. Um, and ASHA is really, um, for the past several years, has talked about interprofessional um, practice. And if you think about the students that are in those ID classrooms, a lot of them have multiple services. They might have speech, OTPT. Um, they might have CVI or something, so they have a teacher that's visually impaired. They might have a hearing loss, so they might have a deaf, hard of hearing teacher. So, you know, with the classroom teacher and the classroom staff and all those professionals, we need to make sure that we're all functioning together to make um, what needs to happen for the student happen. Um, with interprofessional education and collaborative um, collaboration, um, there are core competencies that have been developed um, for for that. And um, you know, shared values and ethics are one. Um, roles and responsibilities is another interprofessional communication and teams and teamwork. Um, those are the things that are going to help make an have a positive impact on the student. And for those students who, you know, you've tried to work on individually um, in your own pullout therapy and you're working on isolated skills that aren't related to anything other than what you tested them on with a standardized test, um, it's no wonder, you know, that people want to possibly dismiss those students because number one, they may, it's not relevant to them in some cases and they may not um, be motivated um, to change those, those skills. Um, but two, if you think about it, I know there was one time that we had um, an autism um, self-contained classroom and we just had kindergarten through um, second grade at our school. Um, we had a student who had almost 57 um, IEP goals. There's no way a student can achieve all those goals in a year. There's just no way, even though they were doing ABA and they listed those goals individually, you know, working as a team instead of having those isolated goals would have had much more of a positive impact on that student. In a survey that ASHA did um, of speech language pathologists using interprofessional practice, um, 
IPP in the school setting was um, used 8% of the time for initial evaluations. And if you think about it, you know, the classroom teachers, especially in self-contained rooms, may have students for several years, so they have a lot of information. I think, too, when you first get those students and you have a student who has maybe a visual impairment or CVI or they have positioning issues, um, those types of things are important to consult on with the other professionals because that's going to inform what you do and what you recommend for that student. At eligibility meetings, 43% of the people felt like they were using interprofessional practice. Um, but if you think about it, that's kind of a forced situation. You know, everybody's reviewing their test results, and so everyone hears those results. Um, you know, the ultimate, the best, you know, best practice for that would be to go over the, um, you know, targets and everything prior to that. Um, so that you can kind of agree on um, what targets you want to use for this student instead of all going in with individual targets. Um, there wouldn't be, you, want, you wouldn't be predetermining because you'll be discussing the um, goals and that kind of thing at the meeting um, when you go to the IEP. But for eligibility, um, you know, knowing what everyone's planning to work on can be really helpful. Um, and then for intervention, 14% of the people um, said that they felt like they did interprofessional practice. We have got to improve that, you know, and I get it. My schedule used to be difficult. I had back-to-back -back therapy. It's hard to plan time, but I think COVID has helped us um, to um, understand that there are some different options now and you don't have to be face-to-face -face and in person to do that. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Oops, let me go back. I um, can't see my little button. Hold on one second. Uh oh. I have to get out for just a second. Sorry about that. See the button on the screen. Um, okay. Okay, so some barriers um, that were defined um, in that survey included um, time constraints and scheduling. And, you know, I get that. We all have those issues. Um, resistance from other professionals. Um, sometimes, you know, there's um, ownership or there's also um, fear that someone is going to be criticizing you or um, watching you for someone else. And so developing a trusting relationship is going to be very important for doing interprofessional practice. And sometimes, unfortunately, there's a lack of support from employers and administration. Um, but um, hopefully that's not going to be a problem um, because um, special ed directors this um, spring received training on high leverage practices. And <coughs> high leverage practice are practices that are effective in improving student outcomes. They're used frequently to um, by teachers and they broadly are applicable across content areas. These practices are also applicable to related service providers. Um, collaboration is the number one practice. There are four high leverage practice practices. Collaboration, assessment, social behavior, and instruction. And honestly, um, <coughs> it's important um, to take that time to have the do the collaboration. Um, with service delivery options, you know, we talked about um, trying to think about ways to provide services other than twice a week pull out therapy into your um, special into your um, therapy room or or that kind of thing. So the three to one model is something you might want to consider. The three to one model is supported by research because it includes a collaborative piece. Um, and we are doing a session on the three to one model tomorrow. So if you're interested in finding out more about it, <coughs> please join us. But <coughs> the main reason it's important for this session 
is because it allows you to have a week where you're not seeing students. You're doing other things behind the scenes. You might be programming devices for them. You might be meeting and collaborating with classroom teachers and having team meetings with um, other service providers. And there are a um, plethora of, of activities you can do that week. <coughs> so you would see the student for three weeks for direct therapy. And then one week you would see them, um, you would provide collaboration services. Um, <coughs> the reason the research supports it is because um, for the classroom teacher and the, the related service provider to know what each other's working on, that makes a huge difference. And, and just that collaboration piece is what's going to help you know that students have reached their potential um, because you've done everything possible to have support for them throughout the day. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, the three to one model is this a cyclical schedule and I just kind of explained to you exactly what it what it does. And there are some resources at the end of this presentation as well that you can check out. And like I said, please join us for our session tomorrow. Um, I think it's tomorrow morning, um, 3 to 1, and um, you'll hear more about it. It's different um, because a traditional schedule provides for direct therapy a number of times per week for four weeks. And with compliance or the um, flexible scheduling in three to one model, it provides three weeks of direct services and one week of indirect. The research um, has shown that little evidence supports the fact that two half hour sessions weekly um, promote students ability to acquire and generalize speech and language skills. But um, when Siren did a review in 2010, they found in many instances that classroom based services were at least as effective, if not more effective in helping students meet speech and language objectives. And that's also the case. Um, because we know that the high lever leverage practice of collaboration makes a difference in um, the student outcomes. You can also consider direct or collaborative service delivery, and especially for those students who might be in high school settings, um, who have a communication system, who you've worked with for several years, and you've worked with the classroom staff um, for several years, and, and they know what to do to help that student daily, all throughout the day. Um, you might consider offering collaborative services, um, which is indirect. And with that, you can be observing in the classroom, providing feedback and suggestions and support, um, and having an, another set of eyes on the situation without pulling out for direct therapy. Um, um, when we had um, experienced COVID, you know, so many of you for IEP meetings and for, you know, your sessions and that kind of thing found out the power of um, teams and um, you can use it for interprofessional practice. Um, you can meet um, with your team and determine how your team will function and I would always include the parent in that because it's, it's the parent is a critical part of anything you do with these students with all students, but especially these students with complex needs. Um, it, figure out the days and times of the meetings, the targeted and embedded goals. Um, we'll be talking about those in just a uh, more in just a minute. Um, you can talk about your data collection methods, team roles, time limits, and always have an agenda. Those are the ways to make the planning effective. Um, so that you know there's not a um, an issue with people saying I don't have time to do this. You know you don't have to draw, travel to another school if you're an itinerant. Um, you can do it wherever you are and with the time limit of you know 15, 20, 30 minutes tops um, for the meeting. <clears throat> um, especially for the um, ID classrooms where a lot of the, the students might have some similar needs. It's really an effective way to um, do that planning for them. Um, you can set up your Teams group and then set up a folder for each student under files. Um, you can set up a video and photo folder and as, as people, um, you know, as a student makes progress or they do something amazing and they want to share it with the team, you can drop it in there. Um, just be careful when you're sharing the folders. Um, you know, if everybody works with all the students, it's the parent um, seeing the information of other students you have to be careful of, especially. Um, use the at symbol when you're doing a general post so everybody in that team sees it. Use at and then the name of the team. And 
it's available for iPhones, Androids, and iPads. I get Teams notices all day long. So, um, but it's a really effective way to um, communicate. And if you need some tutorials on how to do it, um, this is one that Mark Moore has done um, on how to do Teams. <clears throat> now, as I was talking to Lee this summer about another um, issue, she told me about some um, seminar she was watching on um, ASHA Connects, and I asked her if she would help me um, present um, in this um, in this, sem uh, this seminar because I thought some of the it was very exciting and um, was brand new because it was, you know, just presented at ASHA Connect. So, Lee, I am so thankful you're on here with me and um, it's your turn. Yeah, like Lee Ann said, I am not an expert in this area by any means, but it is an area that has become increasingly of interest to me and has shown up time and time again as a common theme in the recent professional development opportunities I've been in. So that is a reason that I definitely wanted to take advantage and share some of this information with you today. The integrated therapy approach is a form of interprofessional practice. It's a practice that requires us to share our expertise with all educators, specialized support personnel, and paraprofessionals that are responsible for a student's success. Integrated therapy approach also lends to providing services for our students in the most natural context possible for maximum intervention and education. It's an all-in team-based approach for our students who have higher needs or who do not progress as quickly as others. The focal point is the student at the center of the treatment plan and all those accountable for supporting the student share in the responsibility as a team regarding that student's progress. With everyone on the same page as to how to best support our student with knowledge and strategies from each other's areas of expertise, we will hopefully see faster progress and more generalization of skills for our students than we have when we've been working in our isolated settings on isolated skills. This would be one huge benefit of using the integrated therapy approach. I found an article that the staff of William and Mary University produced. It was for um, the Virginia Department of Education statewide training and technical assistance center project that had been funded by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So in this article, they shared some of the similarities and differences that they found between the traditional therapy approach and the integrated therapy approach. And I hope that you guys will be able to see that a good portion of this are already things that you are doing to address the needs of your students on your caseload. Integrated therapy is just taking that next step to be more intentional with the collaboration of other team members. Service delivery types are still the same and that you could provide direct one-on-one -on -one therapy, direct group therapy. You could help push in to a whole classroom, teach a station, or work much more in a consultative, indirect manner, supporting the teacher and other paraprofessionals. I love the ideas that Leanne had shared earlier about being able to collaborate and share data in a virtual platform. We all certainly did learn so much over the past year on how to make teamwork successful in a virtual platform. And I really am excited to be able to transition that mentality one step further this year and work on data collection with the pre-K teachers um, that I work in the, the high needs classrooms at my school. Now, this might require some more time up front, but once the integrated approach is established, we should be able to see a shift to more of an indirect or consultative approach as SLPs can gain an understanding of how the student is performing in the classroom and where their daily strengths and challenges lie, as well as teachers, others, therapists, paraprofessionals, gaining an understanding of how therapy techniques and strategies can be carried out throughout the day. Once lessons and units are created, they'll just need tweaked from time to time to fit the student's needs. Also, think of how powerful it would be to be able to share some of our knowledge with paraprofessionals or autism mentors that have a lot more daily one-on-one -on -one time um, with our students in the learning setting. Then these students may or may not even be on our caseload. We would be incidentally helping so many more students at our schools. 
this may even have a preventative impact on the number of referrals that come our way, which we all know could be beneficial as we try to balance all that our workload entails. This does not mean that you can no longer work in your speech room with your students, especially if there are major distractions in the ID classroom or any sort of privacy issues. However, we know that research supports and that policy requires that we provide services for our students in their least restrictive environment. We want to continue to evaluate our service delivery model to be treating in or assessing as many skills as possible in the most natural location possible for our students with their peers. Differences between the traditional pullout therapy model and the integrated therapy approach found in this article came in mostly in the planning of the services and that need for interprofessional education. We don't plan in our speech silo or individual disciplines any longer for these students, as we want to look at all of, the, all of the services that they require to be successful and to participate in their natural everyday setting and activities at school. With our more severe students, we want to make sure these skills will help improve their functioning, not only in the school environment, but transition to improvement in their daily lives as well. If we're continuing to develop our treatment plan and carry out our therapy 100% of the time in our own individual rooms, we're not going to see that generalization of the skills nor the level of impact we could have on our students' progress. So I hope you can see it's clear that collaboration is key with the integrated therapy model and the parents and families should be a major component of that collaboration whenever possible. We want to keep in mind our classroom teachers also. They are physically with our students 80% or more hours a week, and we could never provide that much therapy. But just by sharing our knowledge with our team members in an integrated way, we can make a much bigger impact for students on our caseload as well as their classmates. The topic of advocacy for the role of the speech language pathologist in the school system continues to great gain traction. The integrated therapy approach is an avenue for advocacy for our profession by simply getting out into the classroom and showing others what skills we bring to the table to support our students. Being able to provide visual supports, uh, cueing hierarchy, or even conversation topics that we know our students can be successful at during morning meeting, those little things that we could help provide others to support our students to be successful throughout the day when we're not present is a huge benefit for all involved. The students get more practice of their target skill. The other staff become more competent in supporting communication development and the school SLP profession gets some incidental advocacy. I'm sure those of you that are not in the SLP profession on this call can also see how this could translate to promoting the skills of your discipline in the school environment as well. So typically we jump right in and base our goals off of most recent assessment data and challenges that we see for our students, looking to improve the things that they can't do. However, as Leanne said, the ASHA Schools Connect talk that I was a part of by Katie Christensen. Um, I listened to her. She's a school SLP out of the state of Washington. Her talk was titled Improving Outcomes for Students with Severe Disabilities, Goal Writing and Integrated Therapy. And she really drove home the idea of initially looking at long-term outcomes for our students with more severe needs and building on the strengths of those students as an entire team. We need to consider where we think that they're going and that can seem a bit challenging, especially for those of us that work on the earlier pre-K elementary end of the spectrum um, as the end is a bit more in the distance. However, considering those skills that they'll need as they progress through the education system right from the start will be so beneficial as they can help build those prerequisite skills along the way, which in turn will continue to build on those long-term outcomes one step at a time one step at a time. Christensen referred to the goals as the child's goals and reminding ourselves to reframe our thought process from looking at these are the speech goals, these are the PT goals, so over here we have the vision goals, whatever it might be from our isolated disciplines, but instead 
turning and collaborating and sharing our expertise with each other so that all the providers can be focused together on the targeted skills. When we do collaborate, we want to make sure that we write our goals in a way that we're using SMART goals so that everyone can share an understanding of what we expect from our students and how each person can help each other on the team implement the goal for the desired outcome. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with SMART goals, but just a quick refresher. We want to make sure that they are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. When we're looking at specific, this refers to what you're looking to observe or the skill that you're looking for the student to demonstrate. It's very descriptive, the specific verbs of the goal. Um, you could also specifically think about who you want the student to perform this task with, um, how many prompts we're looking to give them, where we think that this skill will be carried out. Um, just think of somebody inheriting this goal, if we're lucky enough to have a sub for the day, how would we know exactly that they were carrying out what we wanted to? So being able to write it to ensure that they know exactly what we're looking for. Measurable. We need to be able to, as a team, view the data and understand if the goal has been met. So also to think about how others in the student's day might be able to provide you with some reliable insight on if the student is making progress towards his or her goal. Attainable. Can the student actually accomplish this goal in a year? If not, then the goal should be adjusted to match the rate of progress or the learning abilities and patterns that we see from our students as we get familiar um, with working with them over time. Relevant. Will mastering this goal serve a purpose in the student's life? We want to keep in mind family priorities as well as any cultural differences because what we might see as impactful might not be meaningful to the bigger picture for them. Also, taking into consideration any diagnosis or medical condition that the students may have, um, you know, as our, our world is ever changing and more and more information is becoming available recently on being mindful of our mindset on treatment approach, for example, not needing to quote unquote fix our students, especially those that might have a neurodiverse diagnosis. So taking time with this relevant piece and really making sure that we examine that, this is where we'll get the most bang for our buck. Focus on building over time and using those skills across all environments in the student's day. Others should be able to provide support throughout their day um, in this relevant way to help maximize that intervention. And finally, time bound. Simply, do we have an appropriate end date for this goal? Um, other things to consider also are uh, how often progress is going to be reported and um, how often our data is going to be collected would be the, the time components of our goals. So if we're going to look at an example here of a goal, um, Given materials and or stimuli, Fern will improve expressive language skills with 80% accuracy using frequency counts and or data logs. So as we can see, this goal is certainly not specific, making it a pretty difficult to measure. Um, we don't really know exactly what we're looking for our student to do, but we can improve that goal using what we've just learned about SMART goals and change it to something like this. Given language-based activities, Fern will verbally label target classroom vocabulary and objects in her classroom setting to improve expressive language skills from two out of 10 opportunities to eight out of 10 opportunities as measured by the SLP therapy data over three consecutive therapy sessions. So as you can see, this goal is a lot more specific on exactly what we're looking for. We're talking about using um, ELA or language-based activities. It's a lot more clear how we're going to measure this. Um, and the time frame of those three consecutive therapy sessions is noted there. 
So if we wanted to take an improved SMART goal like this and look at applying the integrated therapy approach, we would definitely want to consult the special education teacher for what that target classroom vocabulary might be. So let's say that she shared with us the theme for the week is farm animals, and she shared also a craft with us that they were going to do as an ELA carryover activity. So our OT can help share what they might be looking for uh, tips that they use for fine motor as far as coloring, gluing, use of scissors. Our PT can help us with successful positioning tips. The SLP can come in and help with what level of cueing the child might be able to, um, or what level of cueing the child needs to be able to label the, the animals or how to respond if the child would make the animal noise instead of producing that label, um, even providing some enrichment strategies to expand upon um, vocabulary knowledge with those animals. So for some of you, this might seem easy and exciting to do in a few classrooms, and for others, this might seem overwhelming. And I can definitely feel both of those feels. But if you want to get started, here are some tips. Help educate our teachers, our therapists, related service providers and administrators on the benefits of supporting our students with higher needs in this manner. Work to get their buy-in, even share this presentation with them. This does not need to be an overnight overhaul of your treatment approach. As we said earlier, we need to be providing what is in the best interest of our students' needs, but where the integrated therapy approach is warranted, we just want to start small. Pick one classroom in which you feel comfortable and that you know when you go in, it's not going to be viewed as a break for the other staff in the room. I'm sure you have at least one paraprofessional who would love to know more about strategies to help a student communicate more effectively throughout their day. Start there. Talk with that special education teacher and see if you can't find some time to collaborate with them and begin building your integrated approach to supporting the students which you share. I know time is the biggest hurdle to being able to implement this successfully. However, starting small, just one teacher, one aide, a few students in that class will allow you to start to see the benefits of this practice and encourage you to keep going. And remember, we can do parts of this virtually now also. When collaborating with our students' teams, remember we want to start with those long-term outcomes in mind for our student and think of the priorities of the family as well. We may um, ask the parents and, and they share that they want for their student to appropriately engage with peers at lunch and recess. So think of what are all of those skills that we can help teach to make that possible for the student. Our special education teacher can have social stories during her social skills lessons. SLPs can work on asking questions or reciprocity in conversation. Um, maybe the student is a messy eater or doesn't quite know their strength when they're playing with others. So our OT can offer some sensory tips and advice that can help us achieve that long-term goal in small bits. This can all be done in a variety of ways. You, you can do direct therapy, whole group, consult. You might start teaching the skill directly in the social skills group and then move to a more consultative services observing in the lunchroom. We just need to find what works best to support our students. Also, we want to make sure that we're documenting the collaboration so that if the student transitions, say, between different team members or if they would happen to move, that these supports of this integrated team dynamic will stay with them. Um, it's another reason that we're documenting our parent interviews or teacher interviews for that educational impact in our evaluations and IEPs also so that these long term outcomes can stay consistent. And I know just last night I was working with one of our pre-K teachers to um, write an IEP and IEP goals for a student who is nonverbal. And we were just splitting hairs, going back and forth on um, what were going to be the speech therapy goals, what were they going to consist of versus his developmental delay goals for classroom communication, because he had qualified for support in both of those areas. But using the integrated therapy approach, we can take a look at those more complex students on our caseload with pages and pages of goals and determine if there's a better way to be providing support for them. 
So Leanne is now going to help explain a little bit more in the time we have left about team goals and compliance. Um, but again, this is just an overview talk to get your minds thinking about this approach. Thank you, Lee, so much. <clears throat> I see some great questions going in the chat. And unfortunately, we are going to run out of time. Um, it's like I said, we had a lot of information to share in an hour, but hopefully we can do another. Um, if you guys are interested, we can do another um, session. This, this topic, um, I will go through the chat and um, answer your questions and post it in the um, resource folder and Libby has posted that for you. Um, for those kids who have complex needs, and I'm talking about those kids who have for perhaps have motoric needs, communication, hearing, vision, those kids, if you really think about it, a lot of times their goals come down to be working on communication. And those goals can be included in classroom routines and everybody on the team can collect data. Um, the team, including the parent, determines like five to ten targets and writes the goals that address those targets. <clears throat> there are a couple of resources that I've given you here. They're in your downloaded in your folder, and these are about writing um, goals for um, students with complex needs. Um, one of the ways that you can um, embed those goals is to structure your routines. You know, most of your classes have a routine because that's what your students need. They need the repetition and the predictability. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, um, you know, trying to think about the routine and where you can embed the goals so they get practice all day because those students need that too. They need that repetition. That's going to help you get where you need to be with your with your team targets. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, this is just some more information about structuring routines and um, there's there are some other resources at the end of this um, presentation as well. But when you're structuring routines, we need to integrate into every routine communication skills, choice making, social skills and um, optimal positioning and movement um, for a lot of the students in your classrooms. That's going to be extremely important. Um, when you're considering IEP development, when your team is considering it, these are some of the things that you need to consider um, when you're determining your targets. I'm not going to go through them all right now because you can see them. Um, but then uh, for these kids, and I'm talking about the ones who have the severe needs, um, this might be the progression you could follow for communication, expanding um, to conventional communication because some of them don't use conventional, um, transitioning to symbol use so they can possibly use um, some type of electronic system um, potentially at some point, increasing the communication, communicative intents. We talked about the different reasons they communicate, um, increasing the number of partners, that's going to be very important, and the number of environments that they do communication in and reducing the number of prompts. Those are all things to consider when you're doing your goals. Um, you know, when we talk about this, some of the things you've been putting in the chat box are, are concerns that, you know, we knew you would have. One of the things I always get asked by SLPs is what about Medicaid? Can I bill Medicaid for this? And I'm going to say the same thing for this session that I always say. Medicaid doesn't determine your IEP goals. It, it's the needs of the students that determines your IEP goals. If you can bill for Medicaid while you're doing this, that's fine. But if not, that shouldn't determine whether or not you provide um, team goals and um, and integrated therapy for these students. Um, as far as the time that you're working in the classroom, you deduct that time from the special education teacher's schedule for direct therapy. I saw some questions about that. Um, you know, since we don't do um, co-teaching, we're not considered co-teachers, um, then that's the reason you have to deduct that time. Um, splitting the time you're in the classroom with another service provider is fine. Just make sure you meet the requirements that you set up for your IEP service. And both integrated and team goals can be used for the same student. These are just some examples of some goals. And what I did was just try to make up one, and it's hard to make up one for a, a fictional student, but to show you that you could maybe um, do team goals that are access goals. You know, if the student gets to choose a reward or gets to choose something that they like to do when they finish work and they do work and play, this could be a goal that everybody could do. And then everybody um, could do the observation and checklist and that kind of thing um, so that the whole team is monitoring um, this and they, they that provides them with another set of communication partners and different um, environments with um, the adaptive 
adopted alternate, alternate, I'm sorry, alternate standards um, that you have to do um, for students um, in the uh, self-contained classroom. SLPs can incorporate what they're doing with the, the goals that the teacher might have to choose. Um, since you do have to work on academics and that kind of thing, it's no longer just functional skills. So this is just an example of how you could do that as well and still have checklists and observations and that kind of thing with a variety of partners. Um, I know there were questions. I hope that you have um, put those questions in the chat box. Like I said, I will get to them and respond um, and post that for you. Please don't hold me to it till at least Friday or Monday because we have more presentations tomorrow. But I really appreciate your um, your time and um, your attention and being interested in this um, this topic. And I think it makes a whole lot of sense for um, for these. Um, students um, and it makes it so much easier when you're working as a team instead of doing pull out individually doing therapy um, that way. Um, please complete the evaluation for this course and like I said if you or anyone that you um, know would like to be involved if we do future trainings for this please have them contact me um, through email and I will be happy to um, involve them too. Um, thank you so much for everything and I appreciate your hanging with us for an extra minute or two. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lee, um, for, for everything and for the information you shared. Um, and Libby, thanks so much for always being a great facilitator. Um, you guys take care and um, we will see you soon.